Hey everybody. So coming at you with another kind of ad hoc tutorial uh, that's inspired by somebody's interesting question on Discord. I did one of these earlier in the week about kind of like a noise LFO. And this time it is about detecting sensors and turning them into like MIDI triggers. So the person on Discord who went by the name Everett, thank you Everett for this cool question had this to ask, trying to calculate velocity from a sensor and they would have it work like a MIDI keyboard. Velocity is scaled to zero to 127 and that determines the velocity of the note played. They said they're getting the sensor data into the computer, which is great. And they're wanting to have the initial velocity uh, of the sensor value, which I would take to mean kind of like the initial, like the peak, the kind of like, you know, like the peak of the attack of the sensor value, assuming this sensor is like maybe a capacitor, touch capacitor, or like a distance sensor or something that's kind of going to go from being a, from a state of being sort of like unactivated or not an off or not touched or whatever to activated or touched or whatever, right? So they want to kind of have it, they want to like take the peak of that initial attack of the sensor being touched and they want to hold that peak value until the sensor goes back to its near zero value. Uh, and this is important, this near zero thing, because we know that the sensors, they're quite precise a lot of the time and quite sensitive. So they're not always going to go all the way to zero when you're not touching them or whatever. Um, let's take a capacitive touch sensor just as an example. So this would be like a piece of copper um, that when you touch it, it, the kind of moisture in your skin and your body allows a small amount of electricity to flow. And so then it sends a signal on indicating that it's, you know, that it's being touched. But, you know, if there's a little bit of humidity in the air, um, you can still get a little bit of noise from those sensors, right? You'll still get a little bit of non-zero values out of them. So you need to basically kind of set a threshold that says, if the value is below this threshold, then just consider it to be off, right? Consider it not to be um, activated. Um, so that's kind of one of the first problems to solve. And then the second problem is, um, as you're touching it, you're, the first value that you give it that's above the threshold is not necessarily going to be that peak that you wanna use as the actual velocity. So what you probably wanna do is like wait some amount of time and kind of like keep track of what numbers you've been getting during that time and take whatever the highest number is, take the maximum. So that's that kind of idea of a peak. So I don't actually have a, um, uh, like a sensor like that right with me, but what I do have is a little MIDI controller. So I have a little uh, Fader Fox EC4 here and I'm just like turning a knob to send a CC value. And I'm using a multi slider here in, um, reverse point scroll mode, which is really handy for being able to just visualize what's kind of flowing into the computer from my MIDI controller. So I'm just turning a knob. I'm going to um, divide that MIDI value by 127 to turn it into a, a floating point number between zero and one. And that's always, by the way, kind of the first thing that you're going to want to do is just figure out what's the range of values that your sensor is going to output and just normalize them to zero to one. I think that's going to be the easiest. So of course you could use something like the scale object to do that. So in fact, in the spirit of um, kind of following that, that approach, we'll just use scale here. And so now as I turn my MIDI controller value, my MIDI controller knob, I can kind of see what values I'm outputting. And we'll kind of pretend like this is me pressing my finger on a touch sensor or something. So to solve the first problem that we mentioned about mentioned, which is this idea that the, you know, zero might not really be zero, right? We need to be able to handle near zero. Uh, we can use this really simple, but very useful circuit called the Schmidt trigger. And I got this from the Go book, Generating Sound and Organizing Time, which is a book about gen, but is also as we're learning today, just really useful 
for all kinds of match pa max patching and kind of all kinds of problem solving. It's just a, a really elegantly written book that kind of makes you smarter, in my opinion. So I always recommend, I don't know how many times I've said this in videos, but if you don't have generating sound and organizing time, just go and buy it. You can get it on Amazon. In fact, I think that's the only place you can get it. Um, the Schmidt trigger, I think, is widely used in sort of engineering, electrical engineering and stuff. And the idea basically is that you define these two thresholds. The on threshold is the value that an increasing signal would have to cross for us to decide that the thing is on, basically. And the off threshold is the opposite. It's the value that a decreasing signal would need to cross in order for us to turn the thing off. So what the Schmidt trigger is doing in this case is it's basically looking to see, hey, has this value crossed 0.2? So as I turn my MIDI controller, once I cross 0.2, which is gonna be right about now, then we open a gate. And I'm gonna stick a toggle here, by the way. So I'm gonna go off. Okay, let's try that again. So up to 0.2, and as we cross 0.2, now our gate is, is high, right? And we're using um, another multi-slider here to visualize that gate. So now as I continue to increase this value or if I kept the value the same, as long as it was above 0.2, we would stay in this on state. In fact, not above 0.2 because that's where the off threshold comes in. So now if I decrease the value and I come back down, I'm gonna actually cross 0.2 now but the, sh the gate is still high. It's not until we cross this off threshold that the gate goes low. These numbers could be the same number if you wanted, right? And that may be best for your application, but it's pretty useful that this particular circuit allows us to define these separately. So let me show you how we do this. So, um, I'll actually start by talking a little bit about how kind of the patch is organized because I'm using a technique that I think is a really good practice in general anytime you have a subtractor or an abstraction. Just think it's a good patching practice in general. So what I've done basically is define sort of the parameters of this patch. And I've done that with patcher args, root, and also type root. And this allows me to use a single inlet for my subpatcher and have this subpatcher work almost a little bit like it's a, ma a max object right, where it kind of has these specific type of messages that it responds to, and then you can also send values into its first inlet to get the object to, you know, do the thing that it does. So we, anything that we get at the first inlet, we're going to pass through this type root object, which separates out uh, different types. So anything that comes in that's a signal will go to the left outlet, bangs go to the second, and so on and so forth. Ints and floats to the third and fourth outlets. And so we're gonna send those into the patch to uh, you know, determine whether they're opening or closing the gate, which we'll talk about how that algorithm works in a second. Anything that's a list, we're going to check to see, well, is this one of our sort of defined messages, on thresh and off thresh? And if it is, then we'll pass those through and feed those into the patch so that we can use them in the way that they need to be used. With patcher args, we can also define defaults for both of those two quote unquote attributes of the patch. And we can also make it possible for those attribute values to be set in the, um, in the, in the sub patcher object box here. The right outlet of patcher args is for these at style arguments like this whereas the left outlet is for arguments that don't begin with this at. So an argument in max, by the way, is anything that comes after the f name of the object, right? So always when we have a max object, like let's take scale as, a, as an example, the first thing is always the object name or the name of the patch if it's a, an abstraction. And then everything else after it is an argument. And there are two types of arguments. There's like normal quote unquote arguments like these. And then there's at style or attribute. They're often called attribute arguments like these that start with the at symbol. So the right outlet of patcher args gives us the 
attribute arguments, and the left outlet gives us the normal arguments, which we're not using in this particular case. Um, so let's, with that aside, let's talk about how the actual argument work or the algorithm works here. So we take our on thresh and our off thresh. We um, we make sure that the on thresh is higher than the off thresh, and if it isn't, then we just swap them. So that's what this is doing here. And then we combine those into a list and we stick them in a ZL lookup. So if I send 0.2 here, now we have 0.2 and 0.05 sitting in a ZL lookup. And if we send zero into this ZL lookup, we'll get 0.2. And if we send one, we'll get 0.05. Okay. And anytime, by the way, that we also get uh, new on thresh and off thresh values, uh, we're going to just send zero in here, just to make sure that this thing is getting kind of put into an initial uh, initial state uh, properly. Then we have the signal that comes from the sensor, and we're which should really just be a float. I'm allowing through ints too, but it. We in this case we really want it to be a float between zero and one, and we're going to test to see is that signal greater than zero point two because that's the threshold that we need to cross in order to make the gate go high. So as I increase here, I'm going to cross two. This greater than object told us, yes, you are higher than 0 0.2. And output a one, which we sent to the output, because that's our gate, but we also wrapped around to the ZL lookup so that now we are changing the threshold to be crossed to the off thresh, 0 0.05. So now as I come down with the MIDI controller value, which you can see over here, I'm going to come down slowly, and once I go, I'm below 0 0.2, right? But it's still on. But now when I go below 0 0.5, now it closes. So that's how the Schmidt trigger works. This should be a int, technically speaking, not a float. So yeah, beautiful little circuit. Thank you to Graham and Gregory for sharing this with me uh, through generating sound and organizing time. Go buy that book. Okay, so. Now, once we have, uh, we have, we know basically when the kind of, if we're thinking about this in MIDI terms, the note on and the note off event are. So note on, note off, note on, note off. Now what we are going to try to do is figure out, well, what's the actual velocity that we should send? And the way that I think it makes the most sense to do this is to set some time interval, which in my case is set to 50 milliseconds, but if you're working with something like, you know, capacitive touch sensor or something like that, you may have a much smaller value, like five here. And the idea basically is, once the gate opens, we'll wait that amount of time, five milliseconds or 50 milliseconds or whatever, and we'll output, at the end of that period of time, we'll output the highest value received during that period of time as the velocity. So in this particular case, if I start from zero and I move up, once I cross the threshold, the on threshold of 0 0.2, which maybe you'd want to set this much lower than 0 0.2, that's probably kind of high. You might want to do you know, 0 0.1 or 0 0.05, same as the off thresh, but it's what we have now. So now it's going to wait 50 milliseconds. And at the end of the 50 milliseconds, which is in the past now, it'll output what the highest value was, which happen to be 0 0.205, and then we'll convert that into a uh, MIDI range by multiplying it by 127 and turning it into an integer. I'm going to go back down to the off state. I'm going to turn this knob a lot faster to try to get a higher value here. There we go. So I got 66 that time. Let's see if I can do it even faster. Ooh, 98. That was pretty good. So I just turned the knob really quickly, and you can see there's a steep line here. And so at the 50 millisecond mark, the highest value that this velocity measurement patch had received 
was 0 0.772, and so we converted that into 98. So let's talk about how this particular patch works. So we have a gate input at the second inlet. We have a set the sensor signal coming into the first inlet. We also have the same thing going on here with the type route and the patcher args and the route objects that are doing the same kind of patch architecture thing that I talked about earlier. And uh, whenever we get a uh, whenever we get a gate signal in, um, we can use the change object to tell us basically give us a bang when the gate goes high by monitoring the first outlet for a one and the opposite when the gate goes when the gate changes from being high to low uh, we can monitor the third outlet and basically trigger the processes of in the case of when the gate goes high starting to measure what the highest value has been during this time interval the time interval gets uh, triggered when the gate goes high with this delay. So the interval sets some delay time, which by default is five seconds, but right now we're using 50 milliseconds. So when the gate goes high, we trigger this time interval. We open a gate that allows the sensor values to flow through into this maximum object. And we've set up this thing here that's actually using the maximum object and constantly feeding the last highest value back around into the right inlet of the object, right? Because the maximum object always compares between the first two inlets, or the, the two inlets, and it gives you whatever, whichever one was higher. So it's always going to give you whatever the highest one was. So what we can do is, whenever we get a highest value, we can just pass that back around to the cold inlet, and then the next value that comes from the sensor is going to get compared to that. So that's what we're doing with this loop here. That passes through this F object. So we are constantly keeping track of whatever that maximum value was, and we're storing it in this F object. And when the timer completes, we get a bang that is going to output that stored value, which is going to be the value that we actually use as the velocity. So let's, let's see that in action. So now we're in the off state. And by the way, you saw that when I went to the off state and the gate went low and we got a bang here, we sent a zero through. We reset the maximum counter so that this is a zero here, or at least should be a zero, close to it anyway. And we, um, we sent a zero to the output. But now as I go up and I cross the 0 0.2 threshold, after 50 milliseconds, I crossed 0 0.2, and then 50 milliseconds later, we got a bang here, which sent through what the highest value had been during that interval. And right now, the gate is currently open, but it doesn't, the patch, or at least the output of the patch, doesn't care what these new values are, because those new values are just getting stored in here in the cold inlet and not being output, because we only care about the kind of the beginning. We only care about the attack. Right now, we're just dealing with a, um, like, you could think of it as, like, uh, aftertouch, right? This is just more values that are coming through from the sensor that are not being considered for the initial velocity. Yeah, so I think that's all that I have for this. Um, obviously, I don't have a sensor here, so I could be missing some details, but I hope that this is getting pretty close, and if you're confronting this prob kind of problem, that it's useful to you. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions or ideas. I always love to hear those. Thanks. Bye-bye.